you're known for McLarens. It's what I see a lot of. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you uh, you obviously do Porsche and other mm-hmm. stuff, and, and but what is it about uh, McLaren specifically that either leaves so much on the table to allow someone like yourself to to play, or what what lends itself so well to tuning with those cars? They just McLaren is kind of a funny platform because they're not they're really fast they can be i mean they're fast stock they're really fast tuned um you know then you put parts on them and do everything else and they're great but they have so many caveats and little things um a big thing that we did with mclaren is that um uh my business partner jason added a bunch of safeties to them where the factory ecu didn't have things for like if it was detonating or if you know it went lean or whatever those cars just they they break in so many weird ways and so you know a big part of what we do is we've created this ecu system to make them faster but also to make them safer what's up everybody welcome to the smoking tire podcast today's episode is brought to you in part by viore i love viore they make the best active wear. The performance apparel is perfect if you're sick and tired of traditional old workout gear. Everything is designed to work out in, but it doesn't look or feel like it. It's so comfortable, you want to wear it all the time. In fact, I do. Seriously, it's more comfortable than whatever you're wearing right now. Like you may have noticed with me uh, in our in my videos that I went from wearing like lots of like logo tees and stuff and like swag merch that people gave me for going to their car events and whatnot. And now I only wear these like solid color gray, black and blue t-shirts. Those are all all Viore. Like I've literally thrown out every t-shirt in my closet and replaced it with the Viore t-shirts, the Strato fabric. That's the one I use. And I love it because it's soft, it breathes, and most importantly, it is the best shirt I have ever found for not showing sweat. Like sometimes in the summer we're filming on the mountain, it gets really hot and it gets sweaty. Like, and I am a sweaty person. It sucks. My genetics got hosed, but the Viore t-shirts do not show sweat. It's amazing. Even if I do wear them when I'm working out, which I do, because like I said, they're my only shirts. They are uh, amazing at hiding the sweat when I'm at the gym, when I'm going to Pilates. Uh, it's great. You can use it for literally any activity, whether we're talking about running, training, uh, yoga, Pilates, weights, elliptical machine, but also you can use it for lounging. You can use it for errands. It can just be a t-shirt or get, I like literally have thrown one on under a blazer and that's like sufficient for going out. Granted, I'm not exactly a model of fashion, but it works for literally any uh, activity you could think of. I've got the Viore hoodies. They are badass. They're soft. They're so great to wear on planes. They keep me really warm. They're awesome. Viore's offsetting their carbon footprint 100%. They're reducing and offsetting 100% of their plastic footprint past 2019. They're using better sustainable materials for their products and empowering your best active life. And uh, they are great. The best selling products are the men's core shirt. That's a line, a short, the core short, excuse me. That's a lined athletic short. You can use it for every sport. Uh, The joggers, men's Sunday performance jogger, available as long pants or short. Super, super comfortable. And like I said, the Strato t shirts are my jam. I've literally bought. 25 of them. Viore is an investment in your happiness. Uh, they're offering 20% off your first purchase. Get some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash TST. Now, here's the hard part. It's spelled V-U-O-R-I. Okay, so it's pronounced Viori, but it's spelled Vuori, V-U-O-R-I dot com slash T-S-T. 20% off your first purchase, free shipping off orders on $75, and uh, free returns. Go to Viori dot com slash T-S-T and discover the versatility of Viore clothing. I love this brand. They make great, great stuff. Uh, Also brought to you today in part by Off the Record. We love Off the Record because right now I'm reading a book. 
called uh, Policing the Open Road, right? And, and I'm not very far into the book, but what it pretty much shows is how such an enormous percentage of the fines, penalties, uh, and negative interactions that we have with the police are surrounding moving violations of some kind, cars, traffic, et cetera. And we know that it is an, an economic ecosystem. It's not just about safety. Sure, some of these rules are about safety, but a great percentage of them are about raising money, and they're raising your money. And so what do you do? When you get pulled over, when you are ticketed for anything, and I'm talking about anything big or small, you do not plead guilty. You do not just send in a check. You go to Off the Record, and that's offtherecord.com slash TST, or you could download the Off the Record app and use code TST10. Off the Record has qualified attorneys that cover 97% of the U.S. population. Off the Record will set you up with one of their partner attorneys that will fight that ticket and get those points off of your driving record. That means lower fines. It means your insurance company doesn't find out and the insurance doesn't go up for years and years. Uh, it means you don't have to go to court. They'll go to court for you if it's one of those deals. Sometimes you send them the ticket, you pay their fee, and you never hear literally anything again. I mean, it's a, it's a great system. I've sent them quite a few uh, tickets and literally have never heard back on a bunch of them. So it's great. I love it. They're just It just makes it gone. Now, 97%, it's not 100%. There might be a couple places here and there that off the record does not cover. But like I said, 97% of the population of the U.S. can be helped by off the record. So go to offtherecord.com slash TST. Make an account now so you have it ready. Or download the Off the Record app and use code TST10 on the Off the Record app. 10% off all legal services uh, for the next three years. I think it's like pretty much indefinitely at this point, but at least I can guarantee the next three years that code is good for. So that's why you should download the app now or go to Off the Record now and make an account, offtherecord.com slash TST, because you never know when you're going to need it and you don't want to have to go back and dig for this information later. Make the account now. That way, if you get pulled over and ticketed, you will be confident that you have the resources to deal with it and get those points off your record. And of course, last but not least, if you are tired of listening to me read these ads patreon.com slash the smoking tire is uh, the smoking tire podcast patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast is where you want to be starting at just three dollars a month you can listen to our show on the live stream and ask questions of me zach and our guests guests for the show suggest topics of discussion uh, for the show for just a little more money, you can get an ad-free listening experience for the audio and video versions of our show. For a little bit more than that, you can get the show the same day it's recorded as opposed to waiting until the Tuesday or Thursday schedule. And for just a little bit more than that, you can get the Pro Driver Access, which is everything above, plus an extra ninth show every month just for you. Even on months where we go on holiday and we take uh, a week off of podcasting, which happens a couple times a year, you still get the Pro Driver Show. So you get extra smoke and tire podcasts. And of course, all of that is at patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. <clears throat> Okay, folks, on today's episode, our new friend Mitch McKee of M Engineering is in studio uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. Mitch is, if you ask a lot of the smart people I know, one of the best tuners working today. He used to work with Cobb. He used to work with AMS. He worked with all the big boys of tuning that you heard. He set out on his own to start his own company, M Engineering. Now he's doing McLarens. He's doing Porsche. He's doing Twin Turbo. Audis. He's doing race cars. He's contracted with Porsche Motorsport. And uh, he's here to tell his story and to answer my burning tuning questions, uh, to talk about the kind of customers that tune their supercars. We're talking about odometer rollbacks, and we're talking about a whole lot more interesting stuff with Mitch McKee of M Engineering on today's episode of the Smoking Tire Podcast. You know, I, I, I talked to Tim this morning, but I didn't even want to ask him about the fucking pink car. Yeah, we talked for a while this morning at breakfast, and it it's, you know, 
they're supposed to be testing that car next week. No. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's on hold. They just. Yeah. You know, what do you, what do, you, what do, you do? do with it? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, do you run it as like a tribute? You know, do you try and push it to be, you know, really competitive? You know, and it, I mean, my money was on that car to win this next year. You know, I, I don't know of many real strong, I don't actually know if any Porsche is really coming back to run at that level. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the car I thought that was going to just, you know, go overall, at least be, you know, the fastest and, you know, of the Porsches of Well, the math class. says it's like insanely fast. It is. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, you know, kind of one person removed from that because Batim is, you know, Batim is one of my best friends and Sanders, another one of my very close friends. And so, you know, I, I knew everything that was kind of going on with that and, um, and I saw all that stuff transpire and it was, it was hard because it was heartbreaking to watch those guys, how much time and energy they put into it and not be able to, to capitalize on it, you know, at, at the end yeah, of last year. Yeah, they were year. just, they were, I mean, it, it was like a, it was like a TV build that they tried to make into a real thing Yeah, and it just didn't have the time to no, do it. No, know? and you know, that's the time is really the thing. It was actually pretty incredible to what kind of speaks to Tim and his guys because you know in 2019 when Lucy was built um, with Roth Astier driving you know that car finished at like six o'clock in the morning the day before it had to be at tech yeah we tuned that car for the first time on the racetrack at Pueblo just driving around in circles you yeah. know the car had barely just started and we ended up winning we ended up beating you know porsche's you know fastest porsche wow. broke a bunch of records yeah and does pueblo adjust their prices for last minute no they're like, actually pretty they good should, about it I, if i if i own that track i swear i'd be like prices for within three days of the start of pike's peak are like quadruple yeah where else are you gonna go bitch yeah it's kind of crazy because it's every team goes there yeah, you know, know like when we ran with romaine dumas and champion um, in the GT2 RS Club Sport, I mean, we were there constantly. Um, you know, it'd be cool if there was like a VIP Pikes Peak entry package, yeah, and they rented out the track as an organization, yeah, for like three days, yeah. And if you pay it up for the VIP, then you just got to go because everyone could do a little something. Yeah, you yeah, know? I agree. I mean, that but track's kind of wild. Like, there's the one PPIR, and then there's Pueblo Raceway. There's two kind of separate ones, but the Pueblo won, you know, the year we went with Romaine, we ended up, you know, it's it's kind of a desolate track and we ended up hitting two groundhogs and it ended up taking, I mean, because there was so much car? arrow. Yeah. Mm. And so the guts ended up coming out the back of it and it took the, the mechanics all night to put it back together. I mean, to take it apart, pressure wash all the guts and stuff out of it and then get it back together so that we could keep running. I mean, That's it was just heinous. Yeah, it's so even well, when he ran, he had stickers of you know gophers that had little X's. Oh, through that's them. kind of funny. Yeah, oh, they had time to make the stickers. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know where those came from, but I mean, you know, with Pike's Peak, with a lot of that stuff, it's it's a lot of testing. You know, with Joey, with Batim, you know, with Jeff in the past, like, yeah. you know, I think this year we had 22 cars we supported with three engineers. So, Whoa. um it's just a lot. You know, it's it's a lot of testing time. It's a lot of time away from our families, our, our work, you know, our yeah. office. And, you know, we, we tested this year with Joey and, um, at independence pass, we couldn't even test because it was snowing. So we couldn't take that blue car up, you know, through the snow, but you know, it's just, it's a lot of time spent. So that race, you know, I've done that race now for I think 15 years. Um, you know, we've won a lot, we've lost a lot, but uh, this year just wasn't a great year for it. I mean, yeah, you it was, saw the weather. Yeah, it was, it was horrible. I mean, it was a disaster. Showing up to that weather was like the most like heartbreaking a, like thing. Like a stock car, like one, yeah, basically. Yeah, like, that, <laughs> yeah, and like kudos to those guys, you know, that the champion guys really pushed and, and Donner's was one of my drivers in, pre, in 2015. He won with us um, when I was still at Cobb, we were testing stuff, but you know, a lot of these guys, they've all been my driver. So it's, it's cool to see their successes. Um, you know, it's just heartbreaking because I thought, I really thought this year we we're going to go overall. Yeah. Um, and by the way, no disrespect to Robin Shoot. Robin Shoot won this year. Yeah, but, yeah, no. But to, mean, get, that, to get second in a stock car is yeah, pretty fucking wild. That's insane. Yeah. That yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mitch, insane. you were there in 2020, right? You said, I was. I, I was. think 
So I was filming with the Discovery guys. We were filming Dayo Shahara, and do you remember his car wouldn't start yes, right before I'm his the run? Guy that, you were the guy. I'm the guy that fixed you, I knew you looked familiar. Yeah. Yeah, like you, I remember you walked, because you're wearing all your, your Porsche, Porsche Motorsport stuff, stuff yeah. and you yeah. walked over with your laptop, and I went, the Toyota 2J, and yeah. you plug it in, the car worked. I was like, I don't know what just happened, but yeah. it all really happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Kojima, he lives yeah. here. Yeah. Um, Mike, so... Um, I did a podcast for Mike for yeah, Moto yeah. IQ, but um, yeah, I, we had actually already run, and we we're actually sitting back because you know it's kind of a tradition. We we kind of go back and we sit down and we all have a beer and we kind of just reflect on you know the the hell that was what we just went through, and then you know somebody came up and they just said, "Hey, can somebody help us? We don't know what's going on with this Motec," and um, you know I've got a good amount of Motec experience, and I just ran over there and. We said there was something wrong with the throttle and ran through a bunch of tests, keyed on, key cycled, reset everything, and it worked. And you know, and he that's went up rad. and he won unlimited. That that's, was, that's, 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 that's cool. was yeah, that's that, the kind the of race thing. where people Amazing. would do that. Yeah, you and know, that's the, that's where I like. If it was Le Mans, they'd be like, "Go fuck yourself." Yeah, I'm not starting yeah, your car for you. <laughs> I like that. I like that kind of about Pikes Peak is that it is like you get a lot of the manufacturers, and obviously, you know, we're working for Porsche Motorsports, but. There's a lot of camaraderie, like if you need a part, a tool, whatever, people are always there to help you. And I think that's what makes that event kind of extra special is, you know, even if somebody's out, they're still willing to help, you know, even somebody they're competing yeah. against. And, you know, that's... Because it's not really you versus them. It's you it, both versus the mountain. Right. And, and, it's, and it's dangerous, yeah. you know, and like that's the whole thing. Is when you're trying, not going to crash into somebody, you right. know what I mean? It's yeah. like when, when, there's a, when there's a decent chance that someone could crash into you, take you out of the race and hurt you, yeah. then it's like, no, I'm not helping you. But if, it, if I just watch you drive away and that's the last I see yeah, of you, like, like, best of luck, I'll help you out to get to the start line, you know? A lot of these guys, you know, a lot of us have been around this race for a long time, like the Batims, the Joeys, you know, even when they're still together, I was helping them with Jeff's wart, you know, and, um, but you just kind of all get to know each other through this race and you know, you all know kind of how hard it is. So you want to help each other, you know, you want obviously to be competitive and to win, but at the same time, you want everybody to finish and to come back down the mountain mm -hmm. because... The other thing we have seen is, you know, for three years in a row, you know, I saw, I mean, not physically saw, but, you know, I saw three motorcycle riders die. Yeah. And to see that is, is it really kind of puts everything that you're doing in perspective because um, one year, I believe the year before Carlin died, um, we had a rider go off and practice and he died. And... You know, they shut the whole mountain down, and you have to wait for a corner to go up. And it's just really eerie because you've got a corner, you know, that says corner on the side of the van. He's driving up, and you know he's gathering a dead body. Yeah. So you kind of are just it, – it puts everything back into perspective of, like, how important it is to just keep things on the road, make sure everybody's safe. Yeah. And, um, you know, we kind of just do that for everybody and – you know, hope we do well in, in the end. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with the, uh, it, I didn't want to ask with Tim about the the pink car. I'll ask him next week or something. Yeah. I hope I hope we get to see it race at yeah. some point. But I don't know. We'll we'll see. We yeah. talked about Ken a lot yesterday's show, so we don't have to. We don't need to dwell on it today. Yeah, that's that's a hard one. It you know, I I found out the news. My it was. We were watching that football game the other night where the guy had the heart oh attack. God. Yeah, yeah. And it was my business partner, John Hebeln's birthday. So we were out having a beer, watching the game, and, you know, all that was going on. And then I got a text that, you know, he had passed, and it was just, it was like, this birthday's not very fun anymore. Yeah, you know, I think it's time to call it a night, you know. And yeah. It's, um, it just had such a big impact on everything. He kind of created a whole genre, so to speak. Yeah. So oh, yeah. It's, um, it's a it's a huge loss for so. sure. Um, let's talk about you though. Okay. Um, I, every person I know who is good at building cars says that you are the best tuner working today. <laughs> uh, I think that's uh, maybe a stretch, but yeah, I mean, I've been I've been doing this a long time. Um, you know, I I also have an awesome team behind me, um, kind of a small cog type thing. But you know, I've been um doing this for a long time i've been doing it for about 20 years you know i started with um a shop years ago you know when i was 19 
and just kind you of started s- with your own shop. No, I started with a company called Vivid Racing. I remember this, Vivid oh, Racing. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Remember and this those is guys? way way back when they had just graduated from ASU and started a small tiny shop and were selling JDM parts for the you know. This was new before WRX. they got into Porsches, right? Yeah, and I was kind of there during that, but um, I ended up leaving that, going to AMS Performance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, AMS does all the big the GTRs, GTRs yep. and the, uh, the V10s. And, you know, back then we were drag racing, you know, a lot of Evos, time attacking Evos. So I kind of started with Mitsubishis and doing that stuff. Um, and then basically I started to learn, I started to teach myself this kind of like reverse engineering. Back kind of in those days, German ECU tuning was really a black art. You know, nobody did it. Nobody knew anything about it. It was kind of like, you can pay this guy and he'll give you this file and your car yeah. will do this. <laughs> and Flashbacks so, to WRX forums. Yeah. Right, yeah. And so, I, you know, the mysticism to me was not something that needed to keep going. So in my spare time, I would, you know, reverse engineer uh, Porsche ECUs because I was always interested in Porsches. So... I started doing that stuff um, kind of fast forward and I got um, an offer from Cobb to basically come work for Cobb. And at the time, they had a location in Fountain Valley. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Yeah. So um, I worked out of there and I was doing reverse engineering and basically started the platform, the Porsche platform with the access port. Uh, Me and another guy started that and we made kind of the first uh, 12 iterations. It was of, like 996 turbo stuff, right? Yeah, we yeah. started with 997 and then um, 997.2, and they kind of jumped around. But we ended up doing 12 access ports before I left. Um, but that's where I met with Tim. I heard the podcast yesterday. He talked about yeah. our little adventure at Laguna Seca. Um, but yeah, when I met Joey. I met you know a lot of people, and um, we just kept testing and iterating and learning new things and flashing and why were the why was it such a black art i mean was it just that at the time nobody really knew how to do the flashing portion of it they didn't know the actual data portion of it and still to this day it's it's kind of funny how tuning works is it you know what we do what m engineering does what i have another company in in isle of man called uh, dino spectrum we we write all our own code we write all our own features we write our own data logging you know where 98 percent of everybody else uses other people's tools to be able to do that stuff um you know that's kind of also what makes us different is that we do all of this testing we do all of this stuff all in house all on our own we don't require anybody else for the most part to do any of it so that's kind of where you know Cobb does the same thing they they make all their own stuff all the stuff in house but um you know we kind of branched out started doing that stuff and that's really where I think you know we started to do kind of weird projects with BBI and you know wacky builds and from all that stuff we kind of learned you know this works, this doesn't work, this part works. And then really started to get into the guts of like, okay, we got into a point where now it's, we break down the code at a really high level. We understand how the code works, you know, how a whole boost control function works. Um, It's not just a, you know, this table does this, but it's, you know, physically, how does that, you know, RAM address get moved over? How does it get calculated and where does it get put? Mm. And that's, it's a lot higher level than, you know, most other people do. And I think that's why, you know, people will will say, you know, I, I, I do a lot of, you know, tuning and I'm great and all this stuff. But really what it is, is, you know, myself and my teams have built just great products and great things to back that up. And I just kind of sometimes in the face of it, I guess, but I'm involved in a lot of it. Like, so. do, does each company like Mercedes versus Audi versus Porsche versus McLaren, whatever, do they all write their own tuning language? And it's a matter of like, for lack of a better word, like Rosetta stoning the language? Or is it that they're trying to make it hard for people like you to change the tunes? Or like, you know. The best way I would explain it, and 
this is kind of and I'm fucking dumb as rocks uh, by the way no so. I, you're, you're, <laughs> you're absolutely right on the right path it's a lot of the ECUs are actually the same exact ECUs it's just that it's like some Bosch it's fucking a Bosch, thing yeah. like a Bosch or Continental and and I the, these manufacturers will go to like say Bosch and say okay I've got like for a Porsche turbo let's say you know they have VTGs like a variable, variable turbine geometry right. yeah so Bosch will say here's kind of what we have as a package and there's other companies that sell tools that they can take kind of that base package and then the manufacturer will add to that. You know, they'll say, we're taking this kind of base code and we're going to add our own sections to it for controlling X, Y, Z that, you know, this doesn't necessarily support. So while a lot of them are similar in a lot of ways, um, they also have some pretty big differences. It's understanding those differences. Like, for instance, McLaren um, in the 720s, the wastegates aren't necessarily, they're not really controlled by the ECU. They're actually controlled by the transmission controller. Hmm. So it makes it very hard for tuners because they don't have access to the trans where we wrote custom code um, to be able to basically take over that signal and do whatever we want with the wastegates. So that's why for McLarens, we, you know, have all these records for 720s and make them fast and it's just that knowledge that really deep understanding of how these things are working that make us make our product better oh it's interesting do, yeah. do you have a cs degree or no so you no, so you you self-taught yeah do you have when you were like when you were a kid do you have what i would just call like an engineer's brain like you like seeing how things work and you have that thirst for that knowledge yeah like most of my family are all engineers um most on my dad's side they're you know tulane mit guys um i didn't go to school i i thought when i was younger that i you know partying was a little bit more fun and i probably should have gone to school but probably could have partied harder in school probably <laughs> yeah. yeah probably i, I, I know def- that now i but... definitely did my hardest partying in school yeah <laughs> yeah i uh i should have but i uh i didn't i left and i decided to work and i started in at Vivid shipping packages. And, um, you know, from there, I just, I wanted to learn how to tune and it kind of just grew and grew and grew. When I went to Cobb, you know, I really learned a lot. It was a great experience. I was there for seven or eight years and learned a lot from them. Um, In the beginning, when you first started learning, like the real beginning, mm -hmm. Were you really nervous that you could fuck up a car? 100%. By, yeah. 100, 100%. Did you ever yes. do major damage to a car? Um, or can, I, I think, mean, can you? I mean, can oh, you yeah. do major? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can destroy an ECU or a car very easily. Um, I would say uh, probably the most memorable event I can think of is we went to the Texas Mile uh, when I was at AMS, and I just started reverse engineering um the porsches and we had a 997.1 turbo and we were trying to run it and what i thought was a boost control table was a throttle table Uh so i turned it up so when the owner martin started the car to run the event it started the car and the thing just sat on the rev limiter (laughs) and um Uh, you know you could obviously he was really thrilled with me at that moment (laughs) but it's things like that you know it's growing pains and you you know you just kind of have to figure out exactly what you're doing even then you know i i was just barely scratching the surface of of kind of you know the things i know today you know Mm -hmm. it's like anything it's like learning anything so yeah but it's there's i mean it's can be very risky i mean Mm -hmm. if you if you decide you know that you want to start on porsches or mclarens and you 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 know you fuck something up you blow up someone's you know whatever and it's a very expensive lesson It, it is you try and put that in the back of your mind yeah you know it's um McLaren is kind of how M Engineering started. Um, it's really what kicked off kind of everything. I was still working at Cobb, and um, it was kind of later in my life at Cobb. And I ended up, uh, a friend bought a McLaren and just said, you know, I've got some other friends, they want to tune these. And I just said, I know nothing about McLarens. Um, you know, it was an MP412C. This was kind of early ish in the McLaren days. The 720 had just come out. And so I started kind of messing with that. And then that ended up turning into what is all this. And, and, you know, I ended up flying 
all over the world to tune McLarens. And it was, you know, starting to consume so much time, but also found that, you know, kind of the corporate culture that was, that Cobb was becoming, you know, it's, it's a bigger company, you mm-hmm. know? So I kind of wanted to just go out on my own and see what, you know, just see what I could do. And it was, you know, terrifying. And, uh, you know, I, I'd hope that I'd make it, but, and, and you know, did, but yeah, it just, it's a big leap, you know, it was a big leap to leave, you know, I was one of the higher up engineers at Cobb and to just say, you know, I'm leaving my job and moved to California and try and make this work. So, um, mm-hmm. I did. And, you know, in, in the process, you know, I've got John Hebel, who's a partner. I've got Jason Carberry, who's a partner uh, in M Engineering. And then I've got John Banks and Dino Spectrum. So, um, you know, I've got the two companies just kind of running simultaneously. And it's it's, it's a lot. And it's what's, what does Dino Spectrum do? So Dino in Spectrum. In the Isle of Man. Yeah. So we just moved it to Isle of Man. It was in Scotland. Um, Dino Spectrum is a company that we made um, that does mostly Audis. So it does like the four liter, uh, like older twin RS7s, yeah, uh-huh. the twin turbo versions, and then RS3, and then the V10s. But what we did with Dino Spectrum with, the, with our product called the DS1 is we actually manufacture a device that plugs in um, to cars. And it, we went pretty deep into the ECU, deeper than I, I think anybody really has. So we, enabled the ECUs to be able to do all the live tuning. So you can actually change it like a standalone Mm. um, all in real time. So you can actually sit on the dyno without, you know, in traditional stock ECU flashing, you make your changes, you flash it to the car, you know, you start it, run it, check your log, come back. We made some new technology that um, not only did that, but it also does map switching. So you can um, change maps with the cruise Mm -hmm. control. Um, we do that with M Engineering as well, with the McLarens and with the GT3s, um, but just new technologies. And then we also support with the DS1 the V10s because mm-hmm. um, everybody now is buying V10s and twin turboing them because yeah. they're crazy fast. So we built that, and we also allowed it so that you can wire in your own sensors, things like that, and the ECU will actually – you can make it so it'll do um, – your own custom code to do whatever, like whatever you want it to do. If you want to make a safety, you can do that. You can make it do whatever. So it really is the DS1 kind of made those cars almost like a standalone, but still but on the stock the, ECU. Oh, and why why the UK? Why is it is it? Um, my business it? partner John, he worked at Cobb with me. Um, he just he's UK. Oh. Uh, he lived in uh, Scotland, and he was actually a doctor, and he hated being a doctor, hmm. and. I was just, I mean, the Isle of Man is an interesting place. God, obviously, you've got a motorsports yeah. connection. I thought you were going to say it was for motorcycles or something. No, I, I actually just got back from there. I'd never been there before just a month or cool, so ago. Right? It's amazing. Yeah. It's it's a beautiful island. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a neat place. Um, you know, it's, I, I I need to go see the GT now. I, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, or the TT race. I mean, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, it's also really dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I the first night I got there, I watched, uh, they did like a, like a documentary with following six of the riders. And, you know, to hear that like three or four people had died the previous year. It yeah. Was like, no, like, yeah. like even compared by Pike's Peak standards, yeah, it it's like, like, whoa, you're fucking nuts. Yeah. And it was, I think it's because they're a whole country and they can kind of get away with it. But, right. You know, not. Pikes That's crazy. Peak, so. So. You're known for McLarens. It's what I see a lot of. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you uh, you obviously do Porsche and other mm-hmm. stuff, and, and but what is it about uh, McLaren specifically that either leaves so much on the table to allow someone like yourself to to play, or what what lends itself so well to tuning with those cars? They just McLaren is kind of a funny platform because they're not. They're really fast. They can be, I mean, they're fast stock. They're really fast tuned. Um, you know, then you put parts on them and do everything else and they're great, but they have so many caveats and little things. Um, a big thing that we did with McLaren is that um, uh, my business partner, Jason, added a bunch of safeties to them where the factory ECU didn't have things for, like if it was 
detonating or if, you know, it went lean or whatever, those cars just, they, they break in so many weird ways. And so, you know, a big part of what we do is we've created this ECU system to make them faster, but also to make them safer hmm. um, from themselves. Because, you know, some of these typical owners, it's like any car, you know, if we put map switching in a car and, you know, you've got a slot for 9100 and E85, you know, a lot of owners you forget will, to change right, it, and... or they'll just put in whatever fuel and, you know, we can have the car save itself. Um, but, you know, they're they're exotic and they're neat. And it was a it was a new challenge. But, um, you know, at heart, I've just always been a Porsche guy. And so, you know, from the McLaren, we pivoted and started doing we made our own flashing uh, utility for the 992s and the 718s. So like the four liters um, and then all the 992 Carreras, turbos, that stuff. So mm. we have our own 992 shop, uh, 992 turbo shop car we've been testing with. Um, I've been drag racing with it quite a bit. And what so is it running? It runs, it has a world record right now uh, at 908 at 155. But it's stock motor, stock trans. Uh, it makes about a thousand the wheel. What's con- what do you consider stock motor? Like is that stock turbos? Uh, no, it's got our. It's got a, a proprietary turbo that we had made. Um, so it's our turbo. Really, all it has is it's got meth. I heard you guys talk about meth uh, with Tim, but mm-hmm. so it's got meth, um, the turbos, and an intercooler, mm. and. That's it. Do your turbos still run VTG? Yep. They're okay. just modified VTGs. Oh, okay. So, and they work great. I mean, the car is fast. It's been, it's actually been really neat. I mean, the car has been through. And it's a street car. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. PTS, Golf Blue. It's it's a beautiful car, but we've just beat the living shit out of it. I mean, it's seen nothing but 3,500 miles of just pure quarter mile, use. Yeah. Quarter mile at a time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been tracking it for the past four months straight basically yeah so just gathering data you know we that's a big part of what we do also we gather a lot of data on parts and things that people release because we want to know if you know if a customer asks us does this part do this we want to give them factual data with data that backs it up that says you know yes it does or yeah no yeah. don't do that yeah um, Porsche is pretty good at building things and it turns out a lot of parts that people put on don't actually do what they say that they do. Yeah. So, um, I remember, uh, you know, Jason Camisa. I don't think you know so. Him? He's a he's a very well known car writer, and he's very talented, and, okay. and also very nerdy, and has a bunch of like weird, obscure eighties Euro shit. Okay. Um, he's a he's a great dude, and I, and he uh, he got a set of cams from uh, from Shrick, a well known okay. for an E thirty, a three twenty five IS. Okay. Yeah, it's like if you know BMWs, mm-hmm. it's like. Uh, the go-to for fucking cams. Yeah. Like everybody yeah. gets them. 100%. And for shits and giggles, he dynoed his car before and after, and he gained one horsepower. Oh, my God. <laughs> after, after taking apart, you know, his half of his engine to put these cams in oh and, and all this stuff, and he gained gained one. I believe so it, it. I mean. It didn't really do anything as it turned out. Yeah. We did some testing with, like, headers and things on our car, and- what we found is we we were collecting uh, what we call EMAP data, so that's that's pressure in the exhaust manifold. Mm-hmm. So you know we've got boost pressure, and then we want to see from how it comes in to how it comes out. Um, and we found just putting on headers, I won't say the brand, and and they did you know we gave them all the data and they changed it, but the EMAP data went up 20 psi, meaning that it had 20 psi more back pressure. Than it did just on the Whoa. stock headers, so so, so it's yeah. flowing less. So yeah, yeah. It's flowing yeah. Less. So even though wow. it looked fancy, right, and it, it looked like a thing that would yeah. flow more, hundred percent, it just didn't. No, it's amazing yeah. that you had to give them the data, and that they don't. Yeah, you know, do you'd. Stuff. F- yeah, that's kind of the thing. Is uh, more manufacturers should probably do more engineering data, and to be fair, we do contract, we do do some contract work for manufacturers to give them that data, though. So. Um, you know, we kind of wear a bunch of hats. It's not like we're just, you know, tuning this one car. We do the Porsche thing. We mm-hmm. do, you know, some other things, some some contract services, some, you know. So we do quite a bit. But, yeah, I mean, I think that some things need to have more engineering data because it would be better for sure. paying consumers, you know. Yeah. Are there – have you found a car you can't tune, an untunable car yet? I remember the, the, the SRT engines for a while were – 
So the funny thing about that is right now, as of right now, today, the C8 Corvette is supposed to be the only car I know of that is kind of untunable. There is a company now saying they can tune them. I'm not in domestics. I have no idea. Um, security, and I know this was a question on your last podcast with Tim. Security is and will be an issue going forward. The auto manufacturers are making it harder to keep people out. But to that same kind of effect, you know, they also told us that the R35 GTR would not be tunable. It was not tunable. I mean, I've heard it every, I've heard it over right. and over and it right. and it almost never lasts. The only one I really have never was was actually the SRT Hemi engine, the Chrysler, the 64 I think so. I think now that HP tuners can tune those ECUs. Um, I think you have to send in the ECU to do uh -huh. it. Um, but the security methods to getting around these, you know, the encryption levels that are in a lot of these ECUs now are they're crazy. I mean, they're really crazy, and they're designed to keep people like you know me and my companies out. Um, but. You know, <clears throat> Trey Cobb, the owner of Trey, once told me that, you know, if an, if a human being wrote the code, then it can be broken. And that has proven to be the case on pretty much anything that we've worked on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it does take time. Um, I think it was the F80 M3. It took about a year. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that what ended up happening for that was it was such an easy you know, I say easy, but it took people forever to figure out, but it was such an easy exploit to get around it, but nobody ever thought of it. And that's kind of the thing is- That's funny. It's just the the method of attack is, is always the hardest part because you don't know where to start and you have no idea how long it can take. Yeah. Um, you know, at Cobb, we would always say, you know, they would try and give us timelines. You know, how long is it gonna take to, to get through security on this ECU? And it's literally just a, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we could have it tomorrow. We could have it in three years. We have no idea. Yeah. So it's it's one of those unknowns, but they are making it harder. Um, you know, every year, every car that comes out, especially German cars, they're it's getting harder. So, mm. um, but you know, has any anyone ever made it like kind of like wink wink, particularly friendly, like? I think that some of the domestics have the earlier cars were a bit easier. Um, some of the CAN protocols were pretty straightforward where you needed to just figure out this one kind of little thing that the ECU would ask you, basically a question, and you need to give it a key. Mm -hmm. And that was it, you know, and, and that was fine and was easy. But now it's gone far beyond that. And, you know, now there's whole conferences on, you know, how to break this stuff and, you know, just kind of the whole gambit of it, because at the end of the day, it's just this embedded security gets worse and worse and worse. Right. And, you know, a lot of people have their whole livelihoods tied up in this, you know, like me. Yeah. And so we have to keep working to try and figure <clears throat> this stuff out. So. Uh, but at the same time, you get contracted by Porsche Motorsports. So it's like they know who you are and you're you are a useful person for certain things yeah isn't that weird it, it it is weird and i'll tell you why it's weird is because when i it was in 2017 i went to pike's peak and i was in 2017 we won the imsa championship the gt4 with the caymans mm -hmm. with rs1 and um, I am not particularly liked in professional racing circuits um, because they were kind of convinced that I was helping them to cheat. Hmm. So that year, I believe it was that year, I actually got asked to leave Pikes Peak. Well, if you fast forward and um, Porsche Motorsports approached us and had some questions on um, running Pikes Peak, but at that time it was the 935 and two GT2 RSs. And what they called it was hiring the Fox to guard the hen house. 
So my job was, and our job as a company was to make sure that it was a- That no one else cheated? Yes, uh-huh. and it was between um, David Donahue, David Donner, and- And Zwart. Zwart. Yeah. And so my job was to make sure that I don't do my job. <laughs> so that's kind of where that relationship started and also to watch to make sure it wasn't happening with the club sports. The club sports, right. So. We've kind of been doing that. That relationship grew, um, you know. Then after that year, then people were allowed to flash and do whatever else. But then we were doing data acquisition. We were doing the tuning. We were doing the, you know, everything else except for on the club sports. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we've we've kind of kept that relationship. This year it doesn't look like we'll do it. Um, last year I swore it was going to be my last year at Pikes Peak. Uh, it's, Guess we'll see. We'll see. Um, when you, uh, what do you see in terms of customers, you know, the Porsche customer versus the, you know, V10 customer versus the McLaren customer, you know, obviously they all want to go fast, but like, what is, can, what, can, if you can, if you can stereotype the, these customers, uh, without, you know, you don't have to throw anyone too far under the bus, but, uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> Typically what we see is that the Porsche owner is more of an enthusiast type. They're typically, um, they typically tend to be a bit more affluent and careful with their money. Um, The McLaren customers is a weird bunch because we actually find a lot of McLaren customers are young. Yeah. What we've also run into- Well, they've been shut out of the uh, Ferrari marketplace. Correct. Yeah, if you want a McLaren and you have money, they will sell you one. And that's the thing, is some of these loan terms and things, these guys, <laughs> it's like, they can lease Bro, a car tune for, it, but I'm on it for 144 that's months. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like 10-year loans, and, and the problem that we do have is that McLaren says, once a year, oil changes. But mm-hmm. McLarens burn oil. I mean, stock, tuned, it doesn't matter, they burn oil. So it's- what we end up finding, and this this is one of the biggest Achilles heels with McLarens, is they don't come factory with oil pressure sensors. What? So that's the one safety we can't build in. Really? Yeah. So what we get is what so if you got, lose oil pressure, that motor will just eat itself. When it eats itself, when a when a McLaren motor eats itself, like it's not it's catastrophic to the point of like you could put your whole arm through the motor. Yeah. And like you know, you pull the under tray off, and they're I mean wrist pins the, yeah. whole, the whole thing is just yeah gone. and it's you know with mclaren they, they don't really they're not like the rest of the manufacturers they don't have a lot of money so you know the motors are really expensive they're really hard to get because they have to stop production usually pull them out of a car or one that's about to go into a car but these yeah there's not like a rack of no motors. they don't have you know mclaren of hollywood or whatever doesn't have you know, 10 engines just sitting around to put in a car. Yeah. So what we find is with the McLaren guys is, you know, it's like anything, 90, 98% of them are great. Um, it's just, you get the guys that they neglect maintenance because a lot of them simply are having a hard time just buying the car and affording it. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to pay, you know, five, $600 for an oil change. And, you know, those cars also have some inherent issues with cam phasers, misfires you know you need to change plugs you need to change coils it's a mclaren everything costs way too much money Mm -hmm. so you know they neglect that stuff and when they do that then we run into a lot of issues um you know we've had guys with um you know bad spark plugs and the car's misfiring and they drive for we we had a recorded data log of somebody driving at 200 miles at eight minutes with a car misfiring before the motor let go and it's those types of things where it's like, <laughs> guess what? We just now we've got to build a misfire safety, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, but for the most part, you know, they our customers are really pretty good. What does that safety look like? It just goes into a limp mode. It does. It closes yeah. the throttle, um, and it it just allows you from hurting the car. And right, right. Um, the V10 crowd. But it, would, it's, it would be similar to what a factory limp mode would yeah, look like. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's basically just. Um, pretty much with all the features we add, like we add rolling anti-lag, which is for like roll racing. So you can hold down the cruise control sock, go full throttle. It'll build, it's actually a really neat system that Jason built, but it's, it'll build as much boost as you want. So if 
say you want 20 pounds of boost, you just hold the gas down and the cruise control, the car won't move. And as soon as you let go of the cruise control, you've got 20 pounds and the car's Whoa. gone. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah, and it blows you, you know, fire and stuff That's out. like uh, Porsche's sport response mode. It is, like, on steroids. Yeah. Like, really pissed off. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but it's those types of things where you even build safeties into that because you've got the guys that want to go out with their friends and they want to impress them, but, you know, we don't want the cars to burn down and... So, you know, we set timers so they can only do it for a certain amount of time. Right. And then it times out and you can't do it again for a minute or however we set it. Sure. Um, but, you know, and then then comes like kind of the V10 guys. And that crowd is really, from what I can tell, is is the evolution of the GTR owners that were drag racing and real big into the 2,000, 3,000 horsepower stuff. Well, they ended up finding that the v10 cars with turbos you could turn them up on stock engines like i have one um and i mean i made 1700 wheel horsepower <laughs> in that car on, on a, a stock, stock engine, engine. Yeah, yeah stock ecu and which it like i didn't leave it there i mean that is too much power i i think for the stock engine but i mean yeah but you could drive it around a thousand or eleven hundred oh, yeah, and have the long. fastest street car yeah. ever and it's fine yeah i mean it's there's guys that are running you know there was a thing for a while with the v10 guys to run to see who was the first person to run sevens on the stock ECU, and it's yeah. been done, or uh, sorry, stock engine, yeah, and it's been done now multiple times, yeah. So I mean, realistically, you know, my car is probably a. I is yours know, a Lambo or an R8? It's an R8. Yeah, I, you know, for R8's taller the guys, better car. it is. Yeah. I, I can't fit in a yeah, Lambo. Yeah. I mean, my head's like. Yeah. So yeah, and it's, it's not like with fifteen hundred horsepower. There's a lack of excitement. No, <laughs> and. Um, you know, with the Lambos, I you know I'm not really a flashy car guy either. Um, I think that's also why I like the Porsches. I I've owned a lot of them. Um, I had an, a bright orange 570, and I could not take that thing anywhere without a million pictures and and whatever else. And I think, you know, some people love that, and that's great. Um, but that's not really who I am. And, mm. and so that's why I also like the R8 because it's a little you know it's exotic, but it's not doesn't have the flash of the Lambo. You yeah, know? yeah. But um, it's a dev car, so I use it for dev. I don't drive it that much, but yeah, it's 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 a neat car. But that whole evolution is kind of moving in that direction. You know, the gasoline car is what do we have coming? You know, it's it's kind of getting to this point where you know, twenty twenty three was the last year of the R eight. So what's next? You know, yeah, we've got all these electrics. You know, you've tested a bunch of them, and we've got all these electrics that you know you're you're, you're literally giving dynamite to some of these people to go drive but oh yeah um there's a lot of people that should not have nine no, second I, cars I, <laughs> mark my words i think that there will have to be regulations on ev cars because you're going to get these guys with you know the plaids or whatever that comes out that you know if you run an eight second quarter mile i mean it's like most of these people they'll gas it they won't know what to do you yeah. know even for me running you know an eight second pass like it's you it's know, intense. You've done it. Like, yeah, it's, it's intense. It's intense. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, it's if you've never done it before, and it's like you if know. you can just do that any time, right. like on the street, right. it's like pretty sketchy, it and is. with no noise to warn exactly. anybody else. I mean, yeah. you go out in a in a twin turbo R eight yeah, to run hear. eights. The people who are standing in front of you are aware of what's what could happen oh, yeah, here. 100%. You know, my friend, uh, my friend was just driving a, a Tesla Plaid and literally was like, "Yeah, I gave it like three quarters throttle out of a light and almost like ran some people over." Yeah, they weren't aware, you know. And he ex he, he accepted his responsibility for yeah. that situation, <laughs> but still, um, you know, that's it's we talk about it a lot where it's like people you don't you don't go from a Miata to a twin turbo Huracan. No. You know, there you, you work your way up right. to something like that. Right. But a lot of people go from a Volvo or a Prius, you know, or something not fast to a very fast electric yeah, and car. It's crazy. You know, with nothing in between. Yeah, and for sure. When we run Pikes Peak, you know, the electric car division because they don't make any noise, it's it's dangerous in the fact that animals can't hear them either. Yeah. And spectators can't. So they actually made them. Well, they made them put the, the, the alarms on them. Yeah, yeah. So they're going up and it's, you know, car alarms going off the yeah. whole way. Someone but, had a police siren that I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And, uh, what's his name? Blake something. He just taped his horn down so the horn was on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it's pretty neat, like, what some of those guys are doing. I you got to do my godfather horn. 
Oh, that'd be Zach. Uh, Zach conspired with my Ferrari mechanic <laughs> to put a, a <laughs> fucking joke horn in my Ferrari 328. Oh my god! And when god. you hold the button down, it plays the Godfather theme song. Now <laughs> it's like, like Paulie from Mr. Brano. Find that, dude. eBay, eBay. Like, legit. It, it took two minutes. It was great, dude. I'm I discovered. I discovered it at Pebble Beach. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> he didn't tell me he did that shit, and that's the fucked up thing. <laughs> you do that to someone's car, you're not. You're probably not going to be there when they discover it. And I was at. Pebble Beach Concours, and I was like, I'm going to do that to somebody. That is oh, a it's, fantastic it's idea. It's hilarious. Oh my god! <laughs> you got to do it to the right person that's going to appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I will. I've got some people in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could definitely like you can do La Cucaracha. Yeah. You yeah. can solo it up a little bit. I'll like. have to find something. Yeah, 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 that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Um, so what is the what is the record for McLaren right now? The the quarter mile record. I think we're at. Eight seven, at eight seven is the quickest, fastest we've gone. Was, I believe, in Bahrain with uh, Ikenu Racing at one hundred and sixty-seven miles an hour. That's fucking fast. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really I mean, fast. These cars are moving. That's basically as fast as the Nevera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which I drove and it was fucking insane. The seven sixty fives really are pretty incredible cars because. They didn't really change much. Well, they changed nothing really power wise. They, but the they, gear ratios. Small things. It's the gear ratios. Yeah. The shorter gears make those things absolute monsters yeah, to drag yeah. race. I mean, we can put. When I drove that thing, I was like, you guys, this is sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> You're just yeah. like letting people drive this. I got a buddy who's got a Senna and is putting a 765 gearbox in it. I believe it. Yeah. Which, and he's like, it's 30 grand. Like, why would I not? Like, yeah. yeah, actually, you should. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, we can put tires, downpipes, and flash a 765, and it pretty much will guaranteed run eights on a track. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it. That's you know, crazy. Yeah. The, um, is it, I mean, are, is McLaren leaving a lot on the table? Or is it like, you know, they do. I, most turbocharged cars do leave a good amount on the table. And like, there's a lot of things we do that um, other people, or I should say we don't that other people do. We don't mess with any of like the knock control safeties, any of that stuff. So we, you know, our calibrations, while they're making more power, we do make them so that they're not like at the bleeding edge. Um, but they, they leave a lot, you know, that the, the the McLarens make a lot, you know. I mean, I think on a tune car, we make somewhere around to the tire on pump gas. It's around eight thirty to eight fifty to the wheels with at race a, gas. At a seven six five, seven twenty, seven sixty five. That's a lot. Um, you know, on race fuel or eighty five, they'll make over nine hundred. Are those cars underrated from the factory? Yo, oh, yeah. So, what yeah. is a seven twenty making at the wheels from the factory on your dyno? Uh, it makes about 700 horsepower. At the wheels? Yeah. So they're underrating it by oh, 10 or 15% yeah. easy. Yeah. 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 I would well, say, that certainly explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're crazy fast. I mean, I'm sure you've driven one. I've driven them all. Yeah. They're all fucking yeah, mental. Yeah, they're, they're crazy. I just drove Artura, actually. Have you had to go in the Artura yet? I haven't. I am... The Artura is very cool. Yeah, there's been some teething pains there. No, for sure. Um, for but, sure. I'm, and, and and I don't know anything about what they're like to put a fucking tuner on. Yeah, we don't I don't know anything yet. about that. Either, but, All uh, I can say is, like, compared to a 570S, yeah. it is an incredible package. And Brooks was there in Vegas with right. me, the Drag Times dude. Yeah, I know Brooks, yeah. Yeah, and he did a 10-4 at 140 on the street yeah. just yeah, in the it. middle of the desert. like. Yeah. And and that's pretty fucking good for two hundred twenty five grand. It is. You know, it's pretty good. And the car, like I in the on the same thing, I did one hundred and seventy miles an hour on on the street, like nothing, nothing. Um, and it's not as fast as seven twenty for sure, right? Um, but it's forty uh, percent cheaper. Yeah. And the ergonomics are great. The visibility is great. And it had fucking garbage tires on it. It had like the regular ass P zeros. Yeah, like they, those tires are they make the cars just so dangerous. Yeah. If you put like real tires on this yeah. thing, like even Brooks was like, Yeah, there's a half a second with drag oh, radios I on this it. for sure. I mean that's one of the first things we tell people is is a lot of guys oh well, not a lot, but we'll flash a car like a seven twenty, it'll come, you know, straight from the showroom or, or whatever, and they'll say, Well, the car they won't change any settings, won't do anything, and they'll say, well, the car doesn't feel a lot faster. And we'll say, okay, 
send us your data logs and we'll see it. It's just your the wheel spin is, you know, the wheel slip's gone and it's just buried in the TC. Yeah. And they have no idea. And then they turn the TC off and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to die, you know, That's and the whole so thing. I, I've told this story a bunch of times and I'm sorry if you're here to get them and do it real short. I went to a track day at Fontana out here once with okay. a Press 720. Okay. And it was a Spider Comfort Spec, the, the slowest quote, air right, quotes, right. that one of those cars would be. Sure. I saw 183 miles an hour on the front straight, first off, which was insane. Yeah. And I did a couple of slides in the infield. Some nice, easy, good slides. Right. I'm not a great drifter, but I'm okay at it. Right. Competent. Okay. And so I did a couple nice slides, the, and then I, I'm in the pits, and a guy with another 720 comes up to me and he goes, dude, what traction control settings are you using? I'm like, off. It's, I'm, it's off. And he goes... You're fucking insane, man. I can't believe you turned traction control off. I go, yeah, well, you know, like, I'm trying to be careful, and, and right. I have a lot of experience, and so, you know, it's all right. Yeah, it makes sense. The very next thing, he goes, dude, you got to try my car. It's got the fucking 100 horsepower extra tune. And I was like, so let me get this straight. You thought your car needed 100 extra horsepower while simultaneously thinking I'm insane for turning yeah. off traction control, which basically is what you just said. Yeah, we, we get that a lot where it's guys, you know, Got, regardless of the manufacturer, it's like McLaren, Porsche, whatever, Ferrari. It's you know they, these guys have made some money or you know whatever they've they've decided that you know I'm going to buy a sports car, I'm going to buy an exotic car, I'm going to buy a supercar, and you know they read on the forums, they buy the car, they read on the forums. You know these guys have never been to the track, they've never driven a car hard really. They yeah. don't understand the physics of the whole thing. But they need 100 more horsepower, yeah. you know? And it's like, then you then you hear from them three days later, like, oh, I totaled the car. Yeah. And it's like... And I'm not suggesting that, like, there's something wrong with anybody for not turning off the traction control. Right. Like, if you if you don't think you can, don't. Yeah. You know, and the car will still be really fast. Yeah. It'll be great. But, like, all I'm saying is you also don't need to modify the car. Right. You know, get get to the point right. where, where you, the, you're getting everything the car's got. Yeah. And if that's still not enough... Then we can talk about what you can do to modify it, but it's going to take a while to get to even in a not even in a, a, a C8 Corvette naturally aspirated right. car. If you're at going to a track day and you're full off yeah. and you're making the car move a bunch controlled, now we can talk about power. A hundred percent. You don't need to go from the showroom to the tuner. Yeah. You know, how come you're um, for for a minute? You know, the last couple of years, I thought. Half mile roll racing was the, the the new thing. No one's doing quarter mile anymore. It's all about half mile. And you guys are always talking about at M Engineering on your Instagram, which everyone should go follow the M Engineering Instagram. You guys are always talking about quarter mile. Are we moving back to quarter mile? I feel like there is some uh, M underscore engineering underscore LLC, by the way. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Yeah. You can also just search for it and you'll get it, but it's the one with the underscores. We, we did some half mile stuff. Um, you know, I actually did it years ago with Batim too. Uh, and, you know, when it, with the 996, when we went 200 off the trailer the one time. I feel like that was a big push for a long time. Um, I feel like what that is coming down to, though, is quarter mile racing never really went away. What we are starting to see, unfortunately, though, is that quarter mile tracks in general are getting torn down and gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our retail facilities in Pompano Beach, the, one of the reasons we chose Pompano Beach was because PBIR was right there and it was a 30 minute drive and it was a great drag strip. Well, you know, through COVID, it took us two and a half years to build our, our building. We get set up, we open it, PBR closed. Yeah. Got sold to make warehouses for for Walmart. Yeah. You know, Atlanta drag ships gone. It, you, this just more and more of these drag ships are kind of disappearing, but I think quarter mile racing is coming back. A big part of quarter mile racing is it's a better way to measure a metric to show how well your performance is actually doing. Half mile racing is harder because um you can leave the line softer, you can, you know, kind of roll into it, you can start from farther back. Quarter mile racing is, you know, you've got to get to a light, you have to start at a spot and you end at a spot, mm. you know, and it's, you've got to go as hard as you can from here to there. It's a better way for us to show a metric of this is how much power you're actually getting, where the half mile stuff, yeah, if you want to build a big, big, crazy horsepower car, it's great for that. And you've got the guys like UGR and, 
you know, some of the Vipers from Calvo and, and Antonio. I drove and these a guys. Calvo Viper. It was yeah, he's bad crazy. Shit. I talked to him on the way here. I mean, he's it, that, those cars are nuts. I've never in my life yeah. I driven something that went sixty to two hundred that fast. Yeah, and it these, was crazy. I mean, these guys are going. I I don't remember Underground's record. I, they've got the record I, as far as I know for half mile, but they're doing like high two fifties in yeah. that half mile. I yeah. mean, it's like, and at that point, it's just kind of like, well, what are you gonna? run to compete with that yeah i mean it's so it's a so i think a lot of that's kind of not died off at all but just you're getting some more people that are kind of going back to drag racing and quarter mile stuff um you know i think for me it's you know because i actually drive the car when when we race i have been recently um but it, it for me it's a bit more enjoyable um because it is a bit more intense and it only lasts for you know nine seconds yeah and hopefully eight but you know it's it's just it's there and it's done with the half mile stuff you know i've also seen some half mile stuff go really wrong too you know fires and cars losing it and whatever well else, the rationale so. they always gave was that it was easier on the cars at the start it right because you're not doing it you're not doing a dig and a big launch yeah and that that is absolutely true because you're not breaking axles you're not breaking transmissions diffs that things typically you know because you again you can kind of roll out and go but these days everybody wants that metric they want to know you know there's 50 people tuning cars when what, mm. what makes you a better tuner you know what makes this tune better and and at the end of the day you know it's just showing this is the data mm -hmm. you know and we're big on data and that's that's a big thing with us is there's a lot of tuners out there you know and a lot of these guys now can become tuners and they can buy these tools and they can buy files and and you know all of a sudden now they're tuners and which is kind of scary because you know they can flash a ferrari or whatever and they paid 200 dollars for it and they charge four thousand dollars for it but yeah they don't know what they just put in there and yeah, it's, yeah for us you know they're not data logging in they're not checking it afterwards to make sure it's good and for I us should have come to with donnie's to look at the box mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's just you know it's that type of thing where you know we're constantly looking for data. We need data. Yeah. Um, you know, it's we've done race car engineering for, uh, engineering for years, like doing data acquisition, and you just find that those are the things that you need to really create full, rounded, well calibrations. You right, know, right. They they're gonna work. You know, if you can't just go to Pikes Peak and just slap something in a car and hope it goes. You know, we're literally looking at every single time a car runs even on a practice lap we might make a change most likely we do make a change um for elevation for all these things because you know things change every car is different um you know you kind of hear the monday and the friday car that it, it's a real thing you know yeah, you'll yeah. dyno a car that'll be 30 horsepower different and they're exactly the same that's weird yeah it is the uh you 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 glossed over it but ferrari mm -hmm. um you know now now all turbo motors basically mm -hmm. um no sorry not the 12 cylinders but the eight right. cylinders are and the six cylinders turbo mm -hmm. motors yeah um but the ferrari customer is not really the same i find that they're not really modify the car people right they're not they're we looked at that kind of demographic pretty in depth and they just they're kind of a different breed of people. They don't typically want to do much to the cars, if anything. Um, I do think some of that is perhaps due to just, you know, people like the Flash. And to be honest, I wasn't really a Ferrari guy until the Pisa. Um, the 488 had a tremendous amount of problems with the turbos. Um, that was a really big issue and to the, to the point that even if people wanted to do um, tuning on 488s, sometimes we would tell them no hmm. because the turbochargers would fail. And I mean, stock, again, stock or tune, they would fail. And, you know, that's from Ferrari. If it's on, out of warranty or they void your warranty, it was like $30,000 to replace it. So, you Did know. Did Ferrari make their own turbos? No, they were, I believe at the time, they were IHI turbos. And I remember this because we were working um, uh, here in LA and um a car had died uh a, a line had actually popped off and it overspun and um when we called ferrari of of uh hollywood beverly hills either way they had something like 30 sets of turbo sitting there because it was such an issue wow. and so you know that kind of turned us off from ferrari a bit 
but the the one thing I also will say is the like the super fast, the A12 super fast, those cars with a tune, even naturally aspirated, they make, we make about 100 wheel horsepower with those cars. Uh, whoa, yeah, what are, what are no they sense. leaving on the table there? All kinds of stuff. I really? Mean, yeah, I mean, we make a tremendous amount of power. You think they just built in longevity into the engine so I they do. could, over time, go, well, the new one makes 40 more horsepower, and then, and, and without actually having to change all that much? Yeah, because I think, you know, they kind of, in the in the A12, they, they kind of moved to a newer generation of the V12, mm -hmm. you know, and... That new kind of, I'm sure they knew what it was capable of, but I'm sure they're kind of building up and saving it for later. But yeah. I mean, we started tuning and we we're like, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> the car makes way too much power. You know? It's probably sketchy as hell. Yeah, and they, but they sound power. amazing. Yeah, I bet. Those cars are amazing. They're, the, they're fantastic The pieces cars. are great too. They fixed a lot of the issues in the pieces. And again, like I was never a Ferrari guy, but after driving pieces, tuning them, I mean, those cars are they're they're amazing cars. Have you messed with any of the cars that have uh, hybrid integration? Yep, yep. We're doing an SF90 now for uh -huh. a customer. Um, it's it, we've done a bunch with the Porsches, had great success. Um, you know, with kind of but with their hybrids, with their hybrids. So uh, like the Panamera Turbo right. S hybrid, yeah, oh, interesting. and then like the the Cayenne and. Pretty much all the Porsches mm -hmm. that have any hybrid systems, except for the Taycans, we do not flash those because that's obviously full electric. But yeah. um, we have done some. Um, they can be really finicky. Um, and it's not even for the hybrid part of it. Well, it, there's definitely, you can tell, there is a learning curve for a lot of these guys with hybrids, um, just with faults with electronics, you know, um, cars that literally just die that people don't know how to start them you know things like that there's just we've learned a lot of these kind of intricate things with them um you know a guy wants to put say like an aftermarket exhaust to make it a little louder um with some of the newer you know emissions technology you know we have to keep all that emissions technology and make everything work because the cars just don't cooperate without it mm -hmm. so um you know i've heard kind of the thing of if you change your exhaust and you know it, the car will find out and it won't work. That's not necessarily true, but it does. But it might run weird. Yeah, like it, it, it. There's a lot of work that goes mm. into that. So, um, you Would know. Would you say in general it's not really worth it? I guess if you had an SF90, I, it's. I, I think we go back to the same thing. It's like, do you really need more power? I, I, I personally think the SF90 is not exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's fast. Yeah, but compared to a seven six five, yeah, it's not exciting at all. Yeah, it's not an interesting car to me. Yeah, I mean, there's people who will disagree and they go, "Well, the fucking thing runs nines from the factory. What's not to like?" And I, I hear you. Yeah, but Zach and I drove it, and neither of us found it to be a particularly memorable experience. Yeah, I've never driven one. We've tuned lots. I had lots. I say lots. I, we've tuned f four or five of them. Yeah. Um, you know, people love them, but um, they say they're crazy fast. But, uh, you know, here they're very heavy. They are. Um, and so we'll see. I think that the hybrid stuff is going to take a while to get integrated to where it's all going to work correctly. Mm -hmm. I don't think any manufacturers absolutely knocked it out of the park yet. Um you know, I'm I'm guarantee that you know the new 992.2 is probably going to have some sort of hybrid in it, um, and so we'll start to see that. But um, the Porsche hybrids, forgetting tuning, I mean, when you just just the the Turbo S hybrid mm -hmm. Cayenne, the Turbo S yeah. hybrid Panamera, hybrid Panamera, those are awesome yeah, cars. Yeah, we don't we have zero issues with. Those. I wouldn't fuck with if you just leave it the fuck alone. Yep, they're great. They like, are. I, they I, I have no issues with those cars no, at all. No, they're great. And that is, I guess I can say that is one car we don't deal with. Like, there is no hybrid issues. There's nothing. It, it tunes just like a Cayenne Turbo you uh -huh. know, or a you know, Panamera Turbo. It, it just works the way it should work. Um, we don't fight with them. But it's the cars that are adding the hybrid systems to add more power is where it's becoming more of an issue. Hmm. More of the Porsche stuff isn't really geared towards adding a bunch of power. It's um, more on fuel saving. Sure. It's these. It's to add a bunch of these electronic systems, you know, to make the car go faster. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, we just did a 918 two weeks ago. 
People are tuning a 918? Yeah. Well, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it sounded amazing. Really? Yeah. Does it, cha it changes the sound, the tune? Yeah, these guys uh, here in L.A. had built it, and it, they built like a eight into one header, like a whole full header. It made, I mean, the, the car sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, I saw pictures on the, uh, yeah. Instagram when that was getting built. Yeah. Whoa. It's a neat car. Cool. It's a neat car. Cool. But. Um, the uh, And I heard my buddy Rick Demand said you were working on their GT3 program also, right? Their four and a half GT3? We did a car in... We did a car in um, in our Florida shop. Uh, it was a GT3 Touring, mm -hmm. uh, 991.2 Touring, and it had the 4.5. Um, I don't, I did not have a tremendous amount of experience with the 4.5. Um, it took me a while to get that car really dialed in correctly. Um, there were some, there were some, th it, the car made great power and the Tourings, I don't think a lot of people know, Tourings actually, they detune Tourings. Um, they don't make as much power as the rest of like a GT3 RS. Uh, most folks don't realize that, but with a tune on a GT3 Touring, you gain a lot of power. But on the 4.5, we had some, um, we got it all working, but there were some hurdles that we had to get through tuning wise to make it all work correctly so that the customer was happy with it. Mm. Um, and it made great power. Um, but yeah, that we did do that. Um, you know, I've known Rick for many years. I mean, we, I, I flew there, uh, with this, my now business partner, John, when we were at Cobb and we did, um, a training with Rick, Rick years ago with, uh, the access port. Um, so yeah, we've held kind of Rick throughout the years. Um, you know, I know he's really starting to focus more on this this project, um, kind of doing more of the the four or five stuff. My boxer's a four or five. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's yeah. Really they make, insane. They make really good torque. You know, all, all the kind of four two four three four fives. That's really the. It seems to me to be the really big part of it is just that torque that you get. Yeah. Because um, my car is a street car. I don't go yeah. to the track, and so for me to have. A plus 140 torque from yeah. 3,000 to 5,000, the net is, holy fuck, this car goes really fast. And it's, it's, I think that's a huge point that you made is that I think for increasing displacement in those cars is really where, for a street car is where it makes sense. Yeah. If you were a, a full-blown race car where all you did was track it, the amount of top end you're going to get is not quite as much you're gonna feel most of that kind of down in the middle in the upper yeah. range but if you're just constantly spending you know all your time oh, if i was a track rat i would have bought an rs right i mean i would, right. I would have bought a, a, a right. gt4 rs and i could have if i wanted but right. but no this is a street car yeah. so yeah with the shorty gears and the big fucking bore oh it's good yeah and that that's the thing is like i was always a, a turbo guy you know porsche turbo guy loved them i love the torque until i bought a 991 gt3 and then it just ruined me. But I will say the biggest complaint I have is that unless, you know, I, I bought a 992 GT3 this year, um, tracked it a bunch uh, and sold it. But the, the issue with those cars is just you, if you drive them on the street and you're not tracking them, they're, they're kind of anemic. Yeah. You know, they're kind of rough. And they're also really stiff. Yeah, they're kind of rough and they're kind of anemic. I mean, you get it on the track, the thing is an absolute weapon. And yeah. I call them hero cars because, like, you know, I could put anybody in. A, a GT3 and they're going to do great on track, you know, whether they meet our great drivers or not, yeah. you know, I mean, they do everything so well on track. They break, right. They track control is amazing. Um, but driving on the street, it's just it down low. You've got, it's nothing. It's just yeah. the only way you can kind of f feel it out is you've got to drive it to 9,000 RPMs. Well, the same thing with the R the 4 RS. Yeah, with the 4 yeah. RS, it's from 6 to 9, it's yeah. the greatest car ever made. Yeah. And below 6, you're like, wow, this is yeah. stiff and expensive. Yeah. You know, so that's why for me, it's all about that meat in the middle, and it's the car feels really fast all yeah. the time. So that's yeah. cool. And I do think that that's a great, you know, I'm going to say replacement for displacement, but like, or uh, not replacement, but displacement makes that, you know, yeah. it it does make you know increasing is the displacement for driving around the street really makes that so much better because all my nine like I've, my gt3 rs my gt3s um it's just driving on the street it's just kind of like yeah man you yeah. step on it and you're kind of waiting 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 and then 
you know, once you get to 6,500, then it makes all the noises and it starts going fast and it's like, okay, well, yeah, now it makes sense. But yeah. Are the lower level 992s, and I talked about this with Batim the mm-hmm. other day, but are the, are the, the Carreras and the Carrera S's and stuff, are, are those uh, tune friendly and are they, you know, are they worth putting, yeah, your, putting it, the work into? Yeah, I heard you guys talk about that. And we make so, so you know, with the, the 991.2 uh, Carreras, you know, you had the Bay CS and the GDS. The, all three of those cars had different sized turbos. So you could take a GTS turbo, put it on a base, tune it, and you just, now you, you have a base GTS. Yeah. Now what you have is you've got the base, the S, and the GTS, but the S and the GTS have the same turbos. So now, you know, a base, we tune that car, it's basically the same power level as a stock GTS. If we tune an S, it makes more power than the stock GTS, and then the GTS doesn't make as much because really all the GTS is, is just kind of a turned up yeah. S. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they make crazy power. I mean, they make great power. Our first dev car for that was a 992 Carrera S, and I mean, we took it to, you know, they make, off the top of my head, probably a hundred and something horsepower, uh, you know, at best peak is probably 70-ish, probably about the same in torque. But I mean, we took that car to Laguna Seca, we tracked it. I mean, we beat on that car too, drove it around. And I mean, it, it, don't skip a beat. I yeah. mean, and that generation, you know, you could probably attest to this too with with um, the four or five car. It's just, the interiors are so much better. It's just a better car. Yeah. You know, the media system, everything about it's just better. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, they make huge gains. Yeah. You know, the uh, do we have some Patreon stuff mm-hmm. for Mitch? Let's uh, let's pull that up. The, is there any car while Zach's pulling up our Patreon questions? We got a few. Are you in a super hurry? No, no. Okay, cool. The um, are there any cars where it's like, don't fuck with that because it just. You mentioned the hybrids, but is there any cars where it's like you're like, ah, I don't I don't touch. Those. We don't touch BMWs. Hmm. Um, like the M5, that stuff, and I know that. You know, and and to be perfectly fair, I'm not Mr. BMW. I don't know a tremendous amount about them. Um, you know, there was the M5 motors that had really weak rods, and we saw people starting to tune them that completely stock, and they were bending rods and things like that. And we've just completely stayed away from those. I'm sure there's workarounds for all that and stuff, but that was one car. There's a lot of people that will tell you McLaren's one of those cars because they do have they have some weird caveats, you know, they're, some of them aren't built all that great. You know, we've, they have like hardware issues. It sounds like, yeah, they have all kinds of like, I mean, software wiring, you know, we've had guys that they have this issue where, uh, sometimes the doors don't open. So we've had customers call us, I mean, freaking out because they're literally stuck in their car and we have to tell them how to open it because there's a leather strap behind them they have to pull yeah yeah. but they're like oh my god i can't get out of the car and it's so even mclaren to a point can be argued that a lot of people you know you can ask a lot of people um that are kind of in the industry or whatever know about cars a lot of them will say mclaren's um you know they they have their weird glitches and electrical issues but for the most part you know they're they, they're pretty good. It, again, it comes it's down to It's too bad they have those issues because uh, of the major, mm-hmm. you know, supercar makers, I like driving them the best. I do too. I, I mean, mean, the 720 the or a 765 yeah. is yeah, magnificent. I mean, quarter mile. It's like a cheat track. code car. Yeah, it is. It is. It's absolutely a cheat code. But car. I went to that track day with the 720. I was passing five or six cars at a time on yeah. the straightaways. I mean, like. Like it was nothing. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. crazy. And I'm not any. I'm not anything special. I'm just a guy. Yeah. But like it was fucking crazy that you could reel cars in like that. Yeah. Even a buddy of mine has a 675 that he just bought to track, and um, he tracks it at Coda a lot. And I mean, that car. He, you know, he's on Hoosiers, but that car is running. What did he run? A 209. I mean, it's just crazy fast yeah. time. And it's just like he's not a pro driver. He's you yeah. know he's been driving for a long time, but. He's not a pro, but I mean that's crazy fast. And that's yeah. a six seventy bone stock six seventy five. Yeah. So those cars are really, really impressive. Um, but again, it comes down to do the maintenance, do the things yeah, that you yeah. need to do, and you know, 
and they can be really great that's cars. A good, that's a good general rule. Yeah, you yeah. can't afford to maintain it. You probably can't afford to, to own it. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, okay. Of course, our Patreon is patreoncom slash Tire Podcast. You can ask questions of our guests. You can get the show without advertisements. You can get the show the day it is recorded, and rather than wait Tuesday Thursday, you get an extra show every month. patreoncom slash Tire Podcast. Let's go. I have not previewed these, so I, I will. Uh, I'll, we I hopefully. There's at least uh, some good ones in here. Lucas Tarata says, uh, Mitch, recently APR stopped selling downpipes and tunes for cars with downpipes. How much performance does a factory downpipe rob versus an aftermarket one? And will more tuners go this route for fear of EPA liability? Fantastic question. I hate this question. (laughs) So it depends on the platform. Um, There are a lot of platforms that uh, downpipes don't do anything. Um, A good example is the 991.2 GT2 RS. Um, That car actually, with typically just about any exhaust system, will lose power Hmm. over stock. (laughs) Um, You know, a lot of people don't know that, um, but it's absolutely a fact. We've tested a lot of them. Some of them make a little bit. Some of them only lose a little bit. Um, the EPA question is the question of the day, and it's always going to be the question on everybody's mind. The yes, the answer is yes. You have to. Everybody's going to ha- have to start adapting. Cobb just did that. Um, that's been a huge thing. Um, the EPA is is a force that you have to pay attention to, and you have to follow their rules so um you know it's kind of weird right now in our industry is really strange um to get tuning and stuff certified you can it's just it's it's a long process it costs money it's kind of a whole thing but um yeah you know for let's say a porsche factory downpipe might make uh i don't you know 20 horsepower on a McLaren, it's going to make, you know, probably 30, 40 horsepower. Um, so, you know, they technically do make some power, but everybody will have to conform to the EPA eventually. There's just no question about it. All right. Jake Shores says uh, this, we covered par- part of this. Um, why are more OEMs trying to lock down their ECUs lately? Is it warranty or EPA related? How does it affect the future of tuning? We discussed earlier that it is not. Lately, it's been it, they've all it's yeah they've it's, been trying a long time. They've been doing this a long yeah. time, going back to two thousand nine and the GTRs yeah. and stuff like that. But and and also, I think you answered the question. It, it a lot they're of they're going to keep trying, and I you know I will say with the warranty stuff, you know we never tell anybody. You know, if you get a calibration, you know we don't we don't tell anybody that it's not going to void your warranty. Like they people have to understand if you're modifying a car, you have to understand. The consequence, you know, granted, you know, a lot of like Porsches, we, we have dealers that sell our tunes through the dealerships. But, you know, at the end of the day, if something breaks because of tuning, the manufacturer doesn't want to pay for it. Yeah. And they shouldn't have to, to be honest. Um, and that's kind of the whole thing. So, you know, I somebody had asked about flashing back to stock. Um, some cars, you can do that. There are some ways that they can tell. Um if it has been flashed, um, if they dig deep enough. So it's kind of a crapshoot, really. Mm. Um, let's see. Benjamin Ali says, a question about vehicles with direct injection systems. Are there any long-term maintenance issues with carbon deposit buildup in the top end? And if so, any aftermarket solutions? Awesome. That's a, that's a great question. So uh, a few years, Lexus uh, released a paper on uh, something like this. And what actually ended up being one of the best fixes to do this is basically two things is to run water injection Mm -hmm. um, and simply running water injection to help clean the cylinders or do what like the v10 does um, where it runs a di injector and pfi injectors Mm -hmm. Um, that is that has been a big issue with kind of the original di cars the mazdas the subarus over time you know the carbon buildup on the back of the valve they start to lose power efficiency um, fuel economy but a lot of what's happening is that they are adding pfi injectors because it's able to spray on the back of the valve so that it can't um, 
it can't you don't get that carbon build up on the valves is there like something you can like like a sea foam kind of product that you can put in a car to clean it out if you've already got one of the older cars yeah there is there's a there's a process called walnut blasting oh yeah and you can do that and it works really well you have to take apart the engine to do that shit right you know, I've never done it. I don't think you do. I think they've got it down to a point where you just have to get into the head itself, uh-huh. like, depending on the car. Like, But if you can get into the head itself, then you should be able to, to clean it all out. Um, but that's kind of the step for for doing that going forward for the people that have to. And, and we've, you know, years ago, we used to tell people to go get cars walnut blasted a lot because, you know, there was a lot of buildup. So. Yeah. Uh, RD Speed Garage uh, bought a GT3 Touring and might give you a call. Also, on the hunt right now for a 991.2 GT2 RS and would like to know any spec or year recommendations. Well, I think they're all the same. They didn't change them year to year. Yeah, they made them for two years, right? And they only, they only. That's the same car. You just yep. had a choice of white sock or non white sock. Yep. So yeah. And so really, honestly, it's. Yeah, get comfort you, seats. If you're a boss, if you're a real boss, you get a GT2 RS and comfort seats. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> it's a great car. I mean, literally you cannot beat that car. It, no matter what car you buy, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, I mean they they are absolute. Just we had we had machines. one here for a while, and it was originally it, the second owner was storing it with us, but the first owner was Jensen Button. Oh, really? And Jensen's a friend. He's super fucking cool. Have you ever met him? No. He's the coolest. Huh. He lives locally, and he's awesome. Okay. But he ordered it, and it was Miami blue. Okay. White sock, but with comfort seats, oh, and it was cool. fucking boss. It that's was the cool. coolest. I, I'm pro comfort seats. Yeah. Uh, Chris Navio, I think we answered your question. Uh, is Porsche at the limit with the GT3 engine and PDK, or can you do anything to improve it over stock? The PDK. You said they detune Tourings. Yeah, the PDKs, um, we do flash PDKs. It's hard to beat the GT3 PDK. The other PDKs, we also do flash for the like Carreras and Turbos. That actually makes a pretty big difference. GT3 is hard to beat. Um, we do a couple things to them that does help. Um, the GT3s themselves can make more power, but it's NA. Um, typically, we will run them, tell guys to run them on like 100 octane, and we can make like 25, 30 wheel horsepower, um, you know, kind of realistically with a better fuel. On California 91, as you know, it's, it's a horrible fuel. Yeah. So. But yeah, you can make some. My car, I got to run the Boostane. Yeah, Tim and I talked about that. I think we should make you a 91 map. Rick says it's not good, but you've talked to Rick, and if you if you if you and Rick come I'll talk together, to Rick. yeah, I'll talk to and I'm find not, definitely a 91 not going to do anything he says not to do. But I, you know, we've I've tuned a few cars on 91 octane, and when he said it couldn't be done, I was surprised because I figured like fucking why it's just displacement but also he did change the compression yeah, ratio. Yeah, say the compression ratio. So I don't know. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't the boost stain thing doesn't bother me because right. it's like my fifth car so I don't give a shit. Right, right. Um but it's yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. Um but if you if you and Mitch get together and there is a way to run regular pump gas or a, a dual map. Right. Um well, I, I would uh, whatever you say. You guys, are, okay. you guys are smarter than me. Uh, Dre in Houston, I think we answered your question uh, about the three liter motor. Um, you can basically tur- turn it into a GTS plus. Um, all right, uh, Brian Wolfuck, I have answered this question a million times. Um, do we think that? Uh, uh, Porsche will not build a Cayman or Boxster with similar power levels because they're worried about cannibalizing 911 sales. I mean, yes, I do think that, but they also have a GT4 RS now. So in limited quantities, they are doing it. Yeah, they are. Um, Vlad says he would like to own one of every generation of Boxster. Is it worth including the four-cylinder GTS, or is it too similar to the 4.0 cars? Now, that actually prompts an interesting question. Can you tune a four-cylinder Boxster, and is it worth your time? We did them at Cobb. Um, you can do them with access ports. I don't. We don't tune them. You don't? Um, we, we, Were the results we decent at Cobb? They're they're okay. It's just that motor to me uh, reminds me of a Subaru. Yeah, it does. and um, I don't like Subarus. <laughs> so to me, honestly, like it's just you can make power with them. Um, I've tracked actually uh, 
a, f- a four cylinder turbo, and it was actually tremendous fun on track. Yeah. Um, in tuning them, you make you know 30, 40 horsepower, uh, depending on the car or whatever. But it's not a car that we do um, personally. I would just do a four liter. I think it's a lot more engaging. I I would too, but uh, there's a lot of value in the Agreed. GTS four Agreed. cylinder. They made it for one year. Yep. People didn't really get into mm-hmm. it, and then they bought the four O. So like they depreciate faster than other ones. Right. And they are effective. Yeah. They they they're fast. They're yeah. just not as exciting as the four liter cars. Uh, Sean Finney says, "How reliable uh, do you think tuned, highly boosted modern four cylinders are?" Talking about the AMG four cylinder in the GLA and CLA forty five. There are any any experience with those with the four cylinder AMG motors? No, not much. Um, we are actually uh, working on uh, Mercedes development now. Um, that's something M Engineering will release this year. But um, no, I mean it's it's like with any car, you know, you you got to keep it within a boundary. Um, you know, typically what you don't want to do is have a four cylinder or six cylinder with a smaller turbo or turbos and push a lot of torque through it really down low because that's usually what bends rods and breaks stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think as as long as it's, you know, again, data, it's, you know, half time when people ask these types of questions, it's data log the car and it'll tell, you know, through all the years of teaching people stuff and, and tuning stuff, it kind of always go back to the car will tell you what it wants. You know, if it's not happy, it's going to tell you. And, you know, being able to data log things like that is worth questions like that are really, really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hit Your Marks says, uh, oh, this question is left over from uh, when Batim was a guest and we said okay. to re-ask it now. Uh, many tuners, including M Engineering, claim that their tunes are not discoverable by dealer once the car is returned to stock. This is hotly debated on car forums. Can you explain in general how a tune can be hidden from a dealer, more specifically on a Carrera? Yeah, so we did talk about that. Um, a big thing that's happening that happened, especially with California, is what they're doing is they're um, checking for this value. Um, it's it's essentially what we call a checksum, but it's 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 a value that the manufacturer will give to these emissions places, and so it knows that if the software gets changed, then the uh, value will get changed. There is a way to go around that, but that's pretty illegal, you know, according to the EPA. So. You know, most of everybody's gone away from that. Um, again, flashing back to stock, he, he, most likely at at a kind of like a, a higher level, it's most people aren't going to notice that it's been flashed. It, but again, if if somebody digs in and there is an issue, there's always a possibility that they can find something. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some other things. It's not just flash counters re- get reset. Um, most every tuner does that, um, you know, the, the, all of them. I mean, they reflet, or reset flash counters. Um, there's, a, there's another reason for that, too. Flash counters have to be reset on certain ECUs, like um, Continentals and some others, because if you actually flash it too many times, it will stop working. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's not like a – it's like a safety precaution. It's like a Y2K? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> so you kind of have to reset flash counters a lot of the time. So um, – you know, it's that's kind of a it's a vague question. It's a gray question, just because a lot of dealerships are totally fine. I mean, you can go into some dealerships, you know, Porsches, and say, "Yeah, I've got a tune and you know an exhaust, but I've got an oil leak," and they say, "Whatever." Yeah, and that's that. So yeah, there's all there's also like, how is your relationship with your dealer? Exactly, like exactly. how egregious is your problem? Right. Like, how directly can your problem be related right. to what you've done with the car? Yeah. Like, what does your social media look like? Right. You know, like, and how is, look. is your after sales person a shithead? Right. You know, there's there's a lot of, like, the dealer and, the, and more specifically, like, the one person, like, whenever you interact as an individual with a bureaucratic system. Yeah it always comes down to the mood of that person on that day. Oh, yeah. That person could fuck you yeah. or that person could <laughs> yeah. hook you up. Yeah. And like, and and whichever choice they make, yeah. the system will just go on. Yeah. You know? Yeah, a lot of that has to do with like, I mean, yeah, you've bought 20 cars from them. They're probably going to just do whatever it takes <laughs> yeah. because they've given you a lot of money. Right. So, yeah. you know, that one's kind of a... Um, 
Uh, I think other these are not for Mitch, we but we'll save, save yeah. those for the leftover. I have one question before we send you out of sure. here. Sure. Odometer rollbacks. Aha. Uh-huh. Once you get into the computer, and I have heard this from other people, and you learn how to do tunes, and you uh, it is very, very easy for you to type in that this car has exactly this many miles. How prevalent is it, and what is the truth to that claim? It is huge. In exotic cars especially, because the value of the car is with more miles, it, it they decrease in value. Right. Um, especially in California, we have seen a huge amount of cars do it. And it's honestly something that I am very, very against. Us as a company are very against because it's just, it's not okay. Um, a good example is uh, we bought a Mercedes GTS from a kind of secondhand dealer um, and that car has 20,000 miles on it. And when we drove it, when we actually drove it away, that car drives like it's got 90,000 miles on mm-hmm. it. I mean, it is a, it's getting fixed now. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is just, it's awful. Is and there a way for you to tell that it's been changed? Yes, a lot of the times. So what people don't often realize is that while the odometer on the dash is not being recorded, it's being recorded in the transmission. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times you can check what the trans mileage is versus what the odometer reading is and it will tell you. Um, But it's just kind of one of those things that it just seems kind of wrong. It's shitty, but like it's, and I'm certainly not defending it, but when you said you combine someone who's buying a car they can't really afford, right? the market's hot, right? The the defining characteristic of the value of that car is the mileage. Yep. You know, well, yeah. I, it, I don't, and I'm not sympathizing. Sure. But like, I get why someone would go to the lengths 100%. to do it. And a lot so, of people do it. Which so, and I've heard about like a ton of people yeah. doing it. Yeah, it's a big thing in LA. Yeah, I and mean, so if you, if I customer want to buy a used exotic car, right, and I take my this this car to a reputable place. Mm-hmm. Can as part of a PPI, can that person plug in the appropriate computer? Or do you have to get real deep in the computers usually, to get that trans mileage? Usually, you can get if you have a factory scan tool, you can check both the ECU and TCU mileage. And that's the thing is, some of the cars it might not catch it. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't say for every car it would. I'm pretty sure for a Porsche, you would catch it. Um, but I mean, we've seen them, and it's actually caused some issues. I've heard about issues. Bugattis being a huge oh one because yeah. it's that same like Volkswagen group fucking yep, yep, software. Yep, yep. It's, yeah, those are all ME D17s. That's yeah. Like, or ME17s. But yeah, it's a big thing. And um, we've actually had some issues where just recently f- with Dino Spectrum, we had a customer who was tuning a V10 car and they were emailing in just saying the vehicle speed was, was freaking out and they were you know, is it the tuning? What's going on? And and we checked and looked. And I mean, I went through data and went through, you know, try and help them come to find out it was one of those mileage blockers that caused all these issues of the car because it was freaking all the wheel speeds out and all this stuff. So, yeah, it's caused a lot of issues. And it's it's just it's going to keep going on. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's unfortunately and you're just going to have to do, you know, customers are going to have to do due diligence just to try and check as much as they can because, you know, like I said, I think we got bit with it. You know, we're we'll test right, and it if later. You're, if you're if you're the guy who's blocking your mileage mm-hmm. or rolling back your odometer, you're also incentivized to not bring the car to the dealer right. for shit because it'll show up on a car fax. Yep. You're in, you're actually de incentivized to take care of the yeah, car exactly. properly according to exactly mileage. Yeah, so, which is fucked up. And a lot of McLaren guys do it, so <laughs> it's fucked up. It is. Well, thanks for coming in, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Was me. Good it was talking fun. to you. This is a neat show and I and I like learning about this stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, no, it's fun. And if you and Rick can figure out a ninety one tune, I will happily uh, yeah, volunteer. Yeah, I'll talk to him. Uh, of course, M underscore engineering underscore L L C and uh, M hyphen engineering dot US is the website. Just Google M engineering, you will you will find it. Mm-hmm. And uh Isle of Man. Let's yeah, do that one. Spectrum, that yep. sounds fucking awesome. Yeah. Uh, Mitch, I appreciate your time. Thank yeah. you to our patrons for asking some really good questions today. And we will see you back next week. Bye. Bye.